Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, and welcome back for more MixCon 2023. Today's presentation, this masterclass, is going to be a couple of firsts for us. Number one, this presentation is all about mastering, and we're going to be doing it with not one, but two mastering engineers, both of Lurson Mastering. There is Gavin Lurson, who is an industry veteran, who is multi-time Grammy winner, worked on so many multi-platinum selling records. His client list boasts artists like Queens of the Stone Age, Ben Harper, Robert Plant and Alison Krauss, Eric Clapton. He's worked on films like Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, and Captain Marvel. And his co-mastering engineer there at Lurson Mastering is Ruben Cohen, also a super accomplished mastering engineer in his own right. He's worked with Metallica, Pharrell Williams, Kid Cootie. He's worked on films like Oppenheimer and Mission Impossible 7. These two are going to master two different tracks for us, each with their own approach and each with different needs. And we'll get to see and hear their changes from mix to master. This presentation is free to the public thanks to our friends at Odyssey. Odyssey makes some of my favorite headphones. I'm currently a user of theirs. This is my pair of MM500s, and I know that Gavin and Ruben in their studio really love the LCD-X headphones from Odyssey. I know of a number of really accomplished high-level mixing and mastering engineers who are using their headphones in their work, and no surprise, Gavin will tell us a little bit about why he likes those headphones and a lot about his approach to mastering, as will Ruben. And on top of this presentation, if you want to know more from Gavin and Ruben, you can ask questions. If you're here for the live premiere, type them right into the chat box that you'll find on your screen, and we'll save the best questions as they come in for a live Q&A with Gavin and Ruben that will be happening right after this main masterclass concludes. We've got a whole bunch more MixCon masterclasses coming, so make sure you go to mix-con.com. That's mix-con.com, where you can sign up to make sure that you don't miss any more of the live premieres as they come out. You'll also find that we're giving away thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of free gear in the MixCon mega giveaway with three chances to win. So check that out with links down below, and good luck to you. All right, big thanks to Gavin and Ruben for doing this whole mastering walkthrough for us. Big thanks to the artists, Tony Vincent and Greater California, for letting us listen to their tracks. And big thanks to Odyssey for making this one free to the public. Without any further ado from me, let's get right into it. Gavin, Ruben, take it away. Hi, I'm Gavin Larson. And I'm Ruben Cohen. Today we've got two songs that we are going to work with on our analog console. Ruben and I do all of our work in the analog domain on a console that we custom built. And we're going to demonstrate two different approaches, two different styles of music. One of us will take one song, one of us will take the other. We'll get into all of that. And right now, what we're going to do is take a listen to each of the songs all the way through so that we can both create an impression of each song and discuss that with each other. And then one of us will take one, one of us will take the other. We'll break it down a little bit in terms of how we uh, approach that. The first song we're going to listen to is by an artist named Tony Vincent. The song title is Starting Over. This is just the flat mix, no processing at all, just so we can get a sense of what it is that we're working on. interesting. One of the things I noticed as we were listening is Ruben and I often will, you know, really learn the track the first time by listening through just to feel the energy, where the energy is in the track, the way it should grow dynamically. And I found this both looking at the screen because we felt the song coming to a close and we wanted to kind of learn that end and see how the song concluded itself. So it's kind of funny how those consistencies develop. But also what I noticed about this song is 
that the energies are placed very uh, carefully in terms of how the song really needs to be big and jump out of the speakers and then relax a little bit to keep the listener engaged in the message. It's a great performance. I like the vocal. I like the way the song goes. And what I know from our work, you, you're going to work on this song, so I'll let you talk about it. But I know that what we can do is uh, use our rotary faders here uh, to adjust gain as the song's going so that the song hits compressors and equalizers in different ways throughout the song to create one holistic listening experience. I think we both heard it that way. I mean, we've worked together for, well, almost 20 years now, so we kind of can read each other's minds in terms of how we approach, you know, material and how we'll, you know, take on any mix that comes our way. This this production feels very, uh, very nicely done, lots of energy behind the tracks. I think the talk, the part where we're going to be uh, riding um, down to then so we can then ride back to have those those parts come back with energy is when the guitar falls out. You know, yeah. it's just the vocal and there's like a synth element and drums, but then the guitar hits will be coming back for that and we'll demonstrate that. But in addition to that, I'm hearing that this track could use some some support, some mm -hmm. some meat and potatoes, some something to sit on, so that not that we want to darken the top, but so we can support that top and mid range, and and the whole thing just feels that you can hear into it, you want to turn it up, and it fills the space nicely. That's all there and ripe for the taking in this mix, but not fully realized yet. And I think we can we can achieve that in this process. Yeah, let it bloom out. So this is a a, a classic song that that comes into where we can do what we do to bloom it out. We don't, we don't have to make any surgical maneuvers to save this or save that. The low end is there to work with. We have to shape it right. to create a foundation for this house. And then from there, the music will bloom out, jump out of the speakers. And when the listener listens to this music, what they have to do is not think about anything we did. And they have to not think about the sonic shape of it all. They have to just glue into what that singer is emoting. You know, right. And that's our job to create that. And it's always about connecting to the music. You always want to let the music do all the talking and influence all your decisions. It's not like we have to think, hmm, let me make sure to make sure that this has enough bass in it just so we can tick that off the list. It's not about that. It's about creating a, an end result where you're not thinking of anything at all. You're just connecting with that music. And that thing that is needed is to find that support. So it all falls into place, but in a very natural way that you won't be conscious of us you know, fixing it to, to make it happen. It just naturally comes that way down the road. But to further your magician skills that you're going to demonstrate, that low end support has to be consistent throughout the whole song, but yet the verses have to relax, the choruses have to jump. So how do you do that without, you know, making the bass do that as well? Yeah. So that's going to be the magic that gets demonstrated here to, to get that consistency in one area, but that dynamic in another area and how we're able to do that on an analog console and you know maybe as you do it we can explain where the gain stage sits in terms of where the eqs and compressors all work together so it's it, this is a song where that is necessary this next song we should take a listen to and see if that requires the same thing and uh, maybe come up with a different impression or the same impression let's have a listen to it this is a song by greater california it's called long shadows and uh, let's listen top to bottom and learn it and feel it and see what uh, see what we think Shadow
once again, we were both looking as we felt the song concluding. But anyway, thoughts? Uh, I think that this is ripe for digging into some tube compression, whether it be a manly variable MU in our signal path or a Shadow Hills tube compression. It feels like everything is, is nicely balanced in the mix. There's nothing that we need to do surgically, I don't think. It will reveal itself more once we get it up on the board. And this is the one that you're going to do. So once you start pushing up against something like a tube compressor, it might inform uh, further decisions along the way. I agree. I think that that will bring a nice depth of feel to it. Uh, we've got to make sure to use an, I think, use an equalizer going into the compression. And I would like to combine a tube equalizer with a solid state equalizer. I'd like to shape that low end. Maybe get it a little more punchy. It's a little bit kind of swirly at right. the moment. I think some punch might be nice, but really kind of open it up. Let, let the track really breathe out mm -hmm. and let that EQ kind of inform the tube compression to glue it together and just kind of give it that nice depth of field sheen kind of thing. And I do hear the song kind of starting and ascending like a taking off, you know, airplane kind of thing and then leveling out and being pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. So this song compared to the other one, I don't feel like we've got to do all these maneuvers to get the chorus to jump and all that stuff. It's a much more linear track. I agree. I don't think you'll need to either. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, you know, sometimes along the way, as I was saying, our initial thoughts on a track could change as we get further down the road. But just off first listen, I agree. I don't think you'll have to do some bus rides to, to uh, you know, have juxtaposition, you know, verse into chorus. I think it's once you find a, a certain setting in terms of level into the compression, it'll probably stay. Yeah. And, you know, the, the track, like the, like the other track, um, you have to listen to it a few times to learn where all those maneuvers are. And, you know, I noticed both of us also move our hands like this because we use rotary faders instead of sliders. So we're always, when we talk to each other, we're talking about how to <laughs> put gain into the, into the compressors and so forth. And we have a little trick we, we, we both like that we learned from um, the late, great Arnie Acosta. I learned from, from him uh, many years ago that you can put level in and take level out of a compressor by doing one channel than the other, not right on the money together because that's a bit more audible. So when you do one channel and the other, you sort of ease into that and you can hear this dynamic range and this level uh, move without it sounding like somebody actually made it move because the ultimate goal is to make it sound like it just kind of happened that way. Right. You know, all great music, all great music compositions are like that. It doesn't sound like somebody sat down and wrote the notes. It sounds like they just kind of were always there. So we try to do the same thing with the sonic glue that we create to create an experience to where the listener can connect directly with the music so that it sounds as good as it can, it blooms out. So whatever gets delivered to us, we will offer that service to it. And uh, that's, I think, how people look at what we do, how they can emulate that is really just let what is in front of them bloom out the best that they can, you know. Mm -hmm. And these work in DB steps, you know, based off the termination of our console, that's the way they're configured to to attenuate at. They're also pre the dynamic processing generally, that's where we have it patched in, or we'll, we'll patch the gear around it rather. So it's a little more forgiving, even though it's a full DB, you won't really experience it if we do it right, and we ride it right, you won't experience that level adjustment actually happening, and it'll feel musical and natural if we if we ride it appropriately. It, actually, it also happens post this 2B cue. So it's in the middle of the console, post EQ, pre-dynamic processing. So um, a lot of times we'll be attenuating at about a DB, uh, just as our, our static starting point which allows us to push another dB into this 2BQ to create a little bit of tube saturation. And we'll get into that um, as, we, as we master it each song, but that is often a go-to for us in terms of our gain staging and how we bring some analog texture to recordings. Yeah, and we can, we can patch anything to anything. So this is kind of a go-to starting point for us. And one of the things I like to do, and we do have our differences because we're both humans and we're both creatives and we approach things similarly yet with our own personalities. One of the things I like to do is do what Ruben described, but then have a solid state EQ once the gain stage has already happened. So I'm getting more gain out of the file through the digital to analog converter into the 2 EQ, drop the gain, go into the solid state EQ, and that's where I'll shape the low end traditionally, and then push into the compressors that way. So, you know, we, we do things differently. It's, it's song dependent, it's personality dependent, but it's the same gear. You know, we've worked together for many years, so we relate to each other in many respects on how to do this. But the ultimate goal is that connectivity between the listener and the music.
And I think both of these tracks demonstrate great vocal performance, great story, great songwriting, and great uh, canvas for us to do one approach and then another approach on similar type of, you know, rock music or folk music or singer songwriter music, however you want to classify it. But it's a, it's a slightly different approach. And one's more linear and one's more involved, you know? So let's check it out and see uh, how, the, how it ends up. Let's do it. All right, everybody. I have a setting on the board, which I've tuned for the song. Feels great to me. First thing I'm gonna do is just run through the whole thing with all the rides, and then I'm gonna explain how I got to this place and, and all the things involved. So you'll see that I'm actually starting the song at a dB under of where I want the choruses to really bloom and for the exciting climaxes of the song to, to be at. And uh, I'm going to ride in between these places as the song goes down. So here we go. You probably saw me make some rides from section to section. So what I'm doing by that is I'm following the dynamic range of the mix. When you have signal hitting uh, dynamic processes, they're hugging the signal, they're enveloping and, and compressing. And when you have less signal, all of a sudden feeding into them, they release 
and sometimes the overall the overall level can come up relative. So what I'm doing is is riding that down to uh, adjust for that and compensate for that uh, partly, and also so when I come back, it comes back with impact. So as I'm coming back and those guitars come back in and hit, it feels like it, it's exciting. It lights up the space. Also, based off the way these are configured in the console, it's not just turning down the signal and release and kind of pulling back the level into that dynamic process. It's also subtly, very subtly darkening and warming um, just because you're attenuating and adding that analog attenuation. So it's not like digital gain, it's analog attenuation so that when you when you ride that down, it's darkening a little bit. And then when you come back to where you were, it brings that back and relatively feels like it's opening up. Aside from the rides, what I have here on the on the console is is many processes working all as one global process. Everything that's involved works as puzzle pieces to connect to this final balancing act that all works in a, in a very musical way if done right. So starting at the end and working backwards, let's just talk about your ceiling, digital zero. Everybody's dealing with digital zero. It doesn't matter if you're working in Pro Tools or GarageBand or anything, any type of DAW, we're all dealing with digital zero. I'm limiting right up at the ceiling in this case. The last thing in the processing uh, is a digital limiter. In this case, it's a Waves L2. And I often like using a Waves L2 because it's a bit of a warmer type of limiter. Uh, it sometimes gets some uh, critique for that and not being so transparent, but I like I like that in this case. And we have every type of limiter under the sun really at our uh, disposal, but oftentimes I use the Waves L2 still for that reason to warm up the track so I can then EQ around and into that, which I'll get to. So right now that L2 is giving me about 2 dB. In fact, it's giving me exactly 2 dB of gain on the threshold and the ceiling is at minus a tenth and that's what we're limiting at. And pre that digital limiter is an analog to digital converter. And that is set in terms of its calibration to work with that 2 dB of, of level uh, posted. So sometimes I'll play with that. 2 dB is a good starting point and oftentimes that feels very natural and musical. But if I were to do a dB instead of 2 dB, I would be then compensating for that relative gain and hit this converter by another dB. So those two things meet in space in, uh, in a way that work together. Uh, gain structure wise. Before that, there is a uh, solid state compressor, this Allen Smart C1. That's at the end of the chain. And that is to glue everything together in terms of compression. Think about this as like a layered dynamic process in terms of uh, like EQing into a, dyna a dynamic cake, if you will. So we have some digital limiting dynamic processing. We have some analog co compression that's before that. And before that, there's a high frequency limiter. It's a, um, a mass elect de -esser. It's not to deal with any type of S's uh, as a lot of people use de for. It's to soften the high frequency information. It actually works all the way down to the mids, uh, you know, 2.4K. So it, it helps smooth all of that stuff. Not that this mix needs smoothing necessarily, although it kind of is helpful in this case, but it's part of how I'm going to be EQing into that cake of dynamic processing all working together. Because before that, in this song, in the way I've set this up, are these two EQs, one solid state and one tube. The solid state is, is just shaping the bottom, a little bit of a cut at, at 30 and a little bit of a boost at 40. Uh, both in half dB steps. It's not that this song needs that, but it's creating a foundation for me to EQ up into all of these processes with this. This is the tube EAR EQ, and that's where I'm doing my most of my shaping work um, while monitoring through all of this stuff. So if anything post-it was different, I'd probably come up with a different shape on here. So I'm relating to everything that I'm listening to in real time and monitoring through and creating a preferred shape with just this to work up against everything that comes post. So uh, that might be something uh, worth exploring, just A being this in and out to show what this, this shape maker is doing. And I'll do that more on a um, climactic part of the song. So I'm gonna keep it in at the beginning and then I'm gonna put it in bypass and I'm gonna flip it back and forth so you can hear what shape this is feeding into the global shape of processes post.
when it's in, it all feels like everything's working. When it's out, it feels like it's wanting for something. And our best job is done if it feels like you're left with wanting for nothing at all. There's nothing in the way of you completely connecting to this music, and you're not thinking about anything other than feeling that song. In this case, what I'm doing is really emphasizing, and these are wide cues, so I, you know, I could say 120 because that's where this cue, this band is set to, but it's really everything below, uh, probably down well around 70 or so and up as high as maybe 200. Really broad, wide bands on, in terms of the cue. I'm emphasizing that low mid information, de-emphasizing a little bit of low lows so that when I warm it up in the low mids, it doesn't feel like I'm just clouding the signal, clouding, getting too muddy. I'm emphasizing the low mids and de-emphasizing the lows a little bit. So that is all working as a foundation. The, the de-emphasizing down below is actually brightening it up top a little bit. So I'm getting that support that I was hoping to, even when just listening to the mix, making sure that that the, everything up top, you know, the, the snare, the guitars, the vocals have that nice healthy support that you're hearing as I'm adding that in. And part of how I'm doing that as well is by ducking 3K. I'm pulling that down. So I'm working all of that, you know, kind of giving it that bottom, that low mid support, de-emphasizing a little bit in the lows and also de-emphasizing around 3K to shape all of that below. And then giving it a little bit around six and a little bit around 10 to, as I'm warming it and giving it that support that it feels nice and open up top and making sure that it feels exciting without feeling like you wanna back away from the speakers, but you wanna lean into it. That's all in relation to what comes post. And I'll flick these on as well and on off so you can hear what this is doing. This high frequency limiter is all part of the big balancing act. So I'm gonna turn that off for a second. You'll hear that things get a little bit more edgy up top, a little less smooth. Again, it's not that this song needs that. It's just that I've EQ'd into that to create this final balance that's, that's pleasing. So I'm gonna turn off and on the high frequency limiter just so you can hear what that's doing. see that that's not just affecting just the highs and the upper mids that's affecting everything everything that we do affects everything else and you'll see that it feels a little less supported when I do that you get more high-end information but you lose that connectivity that that driving force of the drums and the kick it feels a little more sparse doesn't feel quite glued together based off how I have everything working uh, in conjunction and then I'm gonna do the same thing here with this Allen smart c1 this is going to give us quite a gain change, similar to the gain change you heard when I was flipping the 2BQ and bypass and unbypass. Um, but aside from the gain change, you'll hear that that everything is gluing together even further with this Allen Smart C1. These are just uh, examples to illustrate how all these processes are working in conjunction with one another to create this nice, beautiful balance at the end. Adding tube compression in mastering can be a great tool under certain circumstances, or it can actually create a little bit of a veil uh, to you know, make you further away from the music, less connected, if the mix doesn't call for it. We have very punchy, energetic drums. There's a lot of compression on this track. Uh, it's the kind of track that I think that adding a, a tube compressor would actually create a little bit of a veil, you'd lose some of that punch, you'd lose some of that immediacy. So I'm not going into any in this case. Very simple chain, digital analog converter on the analog console, 2 EQ, solid state EQ, high frequency limiter, uh, solid state compressor, back to digital on the converter, and some brick wall limiting post-conversion with some rides in between. 
So, there you have it. That's how I approach this song. And uh, now Gavin's going to show you how he approaches the next. So we're about to start the process on Greater California's song, Long Shadows. It's a great performance and it really pulls me in. And what I notice about the song is the way that it kind of builds, 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 and then it reaches a kind of an altitude in which it stays. So the approach that I'd like to take is to really get that low end supported on the track. That's the first thing I want to do. So I'd like to use a 2 EQ and I'd like to send the gain structure of the song into the console, straight into the 2 equalizer, and then through the console and into a solid state EQ, which really helps with the punch. So I want to shape it. I want to keep that kind of tube vibe. I want to keep that depth of field. I want to keep that kind of, you know, Americana type of feel to the music, but also get a little bit of punchiness in it. Not too much like a pop song that it's just all punch, but to really bring a little bit of punchiness to that layer and that depth so that you've got some kind of pulsing to the music that can kind of keep you in the movement of the music. So I'm going to do that. Um, by patching the equalizers in that way, uh, tube equalizer first, console, a little bit of attenuation into the solid state equalizer. And then I'm going to use a tube compressor. I'm going to use the Shadow Hills, which is behind me down there. It's already been set. And usually on that compressor, one setting kind of fits all. And the real way to use that compressor is the, is the gain structure that going into it. The setting is there. We'll see how it holds for the song. And I've got to make sure to send the right gain into it and then back out into the console and eventually to capture this as a digital file that sounds like an analog track. So I'd like this to feel like an analog recording. I'd like the listener to have that sense of analog depth of field. I don't want it to sound edgy, brittle, and digital in any way, so I'm going to work towards that. And I want to make sure that as the track builds, to follow that with the processing I'm doing. So what I'd like to do in the service of that is start the song and let it build but what I'm going to do is follow the build with equalization as it goes. And what I mean by that is that as the track builds in level and it's going into the compressor in the later part of the chain, so in order to do that, the processing that I'm doing uh, will be something I'm doing, but it won't be audible to the listener. All that'll happen when I'm done, when I'm doing, if I do it correctly, is that you'll hear the growth of the song and that no compression or gain structure has limited and reduced the amount of dynamic range that already exists in the mix. So I will be increasing a little bit of mid-range, a little bit of high end as the song elevates in level to keep it even with the amount of compression that's going on. So in other words, I'm gonna do something, but it'll sound like I did nothing, if that makes any sense. So let's try it and see what happens. Uh, first thing I'm gonna do is take a quick listen to the song through headphones only because in making sure that I do these moves correctly, I've got to be intimate with the details of this music. So to listen in a pair of headphones is going to give me that intimacy, that closeness to it. I've already heard it in the speakers and now I want to hear it up close in detail so I can start to get a sense of how much or how little I want to do. pretty good sense of how the track starts so I'm going to go into it a little further to kind of check where the level is a little bigger and I can see visually on the waveform where that is so I'm going to spot around the song a little bit and uh, listen to it from that standpoint Later when 
the song dies down a little bit. Things come sweetly, let them slowly in these long shadows. Okay, so on a detailed listing, what I'm perceiving is that the intensity with which the musicians are playing their instruments does not change so much. What's happening is the arrangement is dropping out and building and that sort of thing. So I'm starting to rethink whether I want to ride the equalization into the compressor. I'm starting to feel it more on a more detailed level now where maybe uh, a global feel really fits the bill here so i'm just going to keep listening and start experimenting with uh, some settings i've already taken a, a, a rudimentary approach for a flavor i want to do but now i want to see how much or a little uh, will be appropriate so we're going to go back to the beginning of the song and see how it builds and in relation to what i have in my mind already and fine-tune it closer to uh, where I want to be and it's starting to feel like maybe a global approach is going to be more appropriate for this To let that dynamic be what it is. So let's check it out So this is how the process works. You, 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 you could have a preconceived notion coming into it that I really want the song to grow and be big and do all this stuff. But in fact, the less is more approach is a bit more appropriate now that I'm getting a more detailed listen and feel for the music through headphone monitors, through speaker monitors and so forth. I'm looking at the way that the Shadow Hills compressor is reacting and the needles are barely moving. And that is, is exactly what I want. It's a flavor, it's a feel, and it's a part of the chain of events in terms of the audio processing devices going through here. So I'm very pleased with what's going on with the 2BQ, the console attenuation, and into the solid state EQ. And I'm really liking how the two compressors holding everything together as that sonic glue. So that's what I meant when I was talking about sonic glue before uh, in terms of how everything is held together to create a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts so that that listener can identify with exactly the messaging of the song and that performance usually of the singer it's always the melodic structure where the ear wants to go so i'm paying very close attention to that and uh it's starting to reveal itself as less is more don't touch it set it and forget it so let's see if that holds <laughs>
That's it. Now I'm connecting with the music. I feel like I'm inside of this mix now. It's got a lot of depth, a lot of layers. I'm hearing from front to back, and that's what I'm looking for. So I'm just going to check it once more in the headphones. My preference is LCDX. This is my go-to. I use it for everything, and it tells me the truth, and it's up close and personal. So let's see what happens. What I'm listening for specifically is whether I feel as inside of that mix as I do when I listen through the speakers. So I'm going to go into it a little bit to where the level's already starting to happen and just before it's reached its peak. Lights make drawings in these long shadows across the shades. Golden days got stretching. exactly what I want. So what I'm hearing is uh, a direct connection through all of this gear, analog equipment that allows me to grab that depth, grab that flavor, grab that blooming of the music. And the overall levels of the music are not impacting in such a way that I have to then alter the levels into the chain to create additional, you know, level, additional dynamic from what's there. What I've done here follows the dynamic, it respects the mix, and that's what you're looking for. I feel good about everything that's been done here, and uh, we'll see you out in the field. So thanks everybody for tuning in and allowing us to show you a little further into our world of how we approach the process of mastering. And thank you to Sonic Scoop for including us in MixCon, and to our good friends over at Odyssey Headphones. All right, I hope you enjoyed that mastering masterclass from Gavin Lurson and Ruben Cohen. Big thanks again to the artists, Greater California and Tony Vincent, for letting us check out their tracks. And big thanks to Odyssey for making this one free to the public. Remember to go over to mix-con.com to sign up for more MixCon presentations that are coming up so you don't miss the live premieres. And if you are here for the live premiere of this one, there's a live Q&A coming up right now where you can ask your own questions. Check the links below, and I hope to see you in that one. Also remember, there's still time to enter into the MixCon Mega Giveaway. We are giving away thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of free gear with three chances to win. Good luck to you there, and hope to see you in the next MixCon video.